beginning of part two. Sports films, like The City, provided a perfect subject and medium for depicting the rapid pace and transition of societies in the modern industrial age. The sheer physicality and movement of the various sports events and activities depicted in these films articulates the forward movement and development of the athletes themselves, as well as their surrounding society. At the most basic level, the movements of the athletes in play or in training points to the forward social and cultural movement of the society as a whole. We can say the same for the athletes' progress and ultimate success in their sport which contributes to the progress and success of the team and society as a whole. The tremendous changes we see in their physical conditioning as they become faster, stronger, bigger, contributes to changes in their performance. They increase their stamina, their endurance, in order to become more competitive. That in turn, of course, relates on a macro level to the performance of the team as a whole. The same can be said for the athlete's self-image, which correspondingly improves as does that of the surrounding society, culture, or nation. Frequently, the entree into sports may provide an entree into another social class. The athlete may become famous and popular and even very wealthy. Success on the field or on the ice may also lead eventually to success in business as the athlete becomes a spokesman for a brand or develops his or her own line of athletic clothing or equipment or he or she may move up into a higher position within the franchise or league as coach, manager, or even team owner. Also significant is that through sports films, we also get a glimpse into a country's system of social and cultural values, as well as its national self-image. Changes in the athletic ideal indicate changes in wider national ideals. That is, what we think are important attributes of our citizens and our leaders. These ideals are reflected not only in the kinds of athletes we worship, but also the actors who are chosen to play famous athletic figures in the cinema. For example, the role of George Gipp, or the Gipper, the legendary Notre Dame quarterback in the Hollywood classic Newt Rockne, All-American, directed by Lloyd Bacon in 1940, which starred none other than Ronald Reagan, who would wind up serving as the 40th President of the United States. Or think of the qualities that actor Kevin Costner brings to all the sports figures he's played in films like Bull Durham, For the Love of the Game, Field of Dreams, Tin Cup, Draft Day, and McFarland. That gentle toughness, strength, and humility, quiet authority, and that solid, unshakable sense of values. All of those qualities we believe are shared by ideal men and social leaders. As well, changing images of the athletic ideal can also be related to changes taking place in the wider cultural and national self-image, but also in that sense of teamwork and community which is required for growth and success. The sports films portray not only the events or games, but also the spectators drawn together en masse, which indicates a shift from individual to collective consciousness, as well as an exchange of traditions and rituals associated with the old way of life in the rural milieu for traditions and rituals of the urban masses. To get back to Kevin Costner for a moment, one of the most endearing elements of his screen persona, particularly in his sports roles, is his nod to tradition, ritual, and a nostalgia for a bygone way of life and for certain kinds of masculine role models and heroes who seem to become increasingly rare. And so in a way, a large part of his popularity stems from his connection between past and present and, being, and between tradition and modernity. That connection relies upon the audience's familiarity, both with the rituals and customs of sport, present and past, which they continue to rely upon as a means of cultural identification. This reaffirms their common heritage and unites them in a shared, transcendent national culture. Perhaps this is why so many of Costner's sports films are not urban, particularly his baseball films, which are rural or small town in their setting and in their values. For example, Bull Durham is about a major league pitcher, Crash Davis, demoted to the minors, who comes to catch for the Bulls in Durham. Although a thriving city at one time, home of the Duke family, the tobacco industry, Duke University, and a center for the civil rights movement, 
What is emphasized in this film is the small town flavor of Durham and old fashioned values of baseball counterposed against the newfangled league strategies and the players' hunger for money, fame, and a ticket to the majors or the show. As the fortunes and career options of the crazy wildcat team pitcher ascend, we see Crash Davis's opportunities take the opposite downward trajectory. But inevitably, this proves to be the making of him as he falls in love with a local woman and decides to stay on as a little league coach. In Field of Dreams, directed by Phil Alden Robinson in 1989, farmer Ray Kinsella hears a mysterious voice in his cornfield, which tells him to plow it down and build a baseball field. And that inevitably proves to be the redemption of the disgraced Chicago White Sox players who received lifetime bans from baseball in 1919 for betting against their own team in the World Series. They appear in the cornfield each evening at magic hour to play. Legendary ghosts who clearly represent a golden age in baseball and America's rural agrarian past, and who make it possible for Ray the farmer to repair his relationship with his now dead father, a former baseball player himself, from whom Ray had become estranged. Thus, despite the fact that baseball is very much an urban sport, for example, legendary teams like the Brooklyn Dodgers, New York Yankees, and Chicago White Sox, it has been mythologized as something connected to the countryside and to old-fashioned American values. This stands in contrast to more viscerally urban sports, which call to mind not an idealized national past, but rather its current context. We've talked about the city as the epicenter of modernity and industrialization, as well as the primary site of arrival and residence for generations of immigrants, ethnics, including Latinos and African Americans who inhabited the poorest areas and neighborhoods and occupied the lowest socioeconomic stratum of society. Lacking higher education or training, and in some cases ignorant of the language, local customs and culture, and as the targets of racist discrimination, there were very few opportunities for upward mobility and escape from these ethnic and racial ghettos. For some, sports provided that outlook. Sports and athletics were more extensively organized in the urban areas, and there were more opportunities for participation due to the density of the population and the greater degree of proximity between races and ethnicities. And for the spectators' part, organized sports and athletic activities offered the fantasy of fame and fortune, plus the vicarious thrill of watching their own athletes playing with or even competing against members of the dominant culture or race and occasionally emerging triumphant. To the spectators, such athletic stars are national heroes, important symbols of ethnic or racial ascendancy and equality. And so to a considerable degree, the sports films function importantly as Cinderella stories that track legendary athletes as they achieve success on an unprecedented scale. As both a form of mass entertainment and as a lucrative mass market, Professional sports spawned numerous other related businesses and sources of capital. Team franchises, merchandising, the construction of sports stadia and arena, the manufacturing of sports equipment, competitions and championships, publicity, advertising, the marketing of athletic stars, tourism, and so on. All these markets helped to further encourage and expand the participation of ethnic and race athletes in professional sports including baseball, football, and basketball, and boxing, and in sports leagues that were formerly dominated by white teams. However, not all sports were or are financially or geographically available to all, particularly to those of other races or ethnicities who occupied the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum, living in the poorer parts of the city. For example, swimming requires the availability of free local pools. Baseball requires the availability of parks and uniforms and people to manage the leagues and teams. Hockey requires rinks or arenas. Skiing requires access to mountains and snow and expensive equipment, and so on. Other integral factors included the influence of parents, peers, and role models for support and assistance, and the affordability of lessons and training. And of course, there is that issue of racial discrimination, which I mentioned earlier. In the pre-civil rights era, this manifested itself in the color line, which produced segregated sports. 
In the United States, for example, there was a separate Negro Baseball League, which was finally broken when Jackie Robinson became the first African American drafted to the major leagues in 1947 to play for the Brooklyn Dodgers. But even in Brooklyn, a borough with a large African American presence, he faced terrible bigotry from players and fans who sought to drive him out. Racial barriers were also broken in 1947 in professional basketball when Japanese American Wataru Misaka played for the New York Knicks. The NBA officially integrated in 1950 when several African Americans joined various teams. Chuck Cooper joined the Boston Celtics, Nat Sweetwater Clifton joined the Knicks, and Earl Lloyd joined the Washington Capitals. Still, racial discrimination continues today. For example, in racial discrepancies at the management levels of teams. There are many fewer African Americans who are in positions of power in professional sports leagues. Not only is this continuing evidence of racism, but it also impacts those of other races and ethnicities entering sports who don't have members of their own groups as role models. They must continually accept white managers, coaches, and trainers as primary figures of authority. To be sure, increased participation and visibility of ethnic and race athletes in sport was facilitated by the mass media, particularly television, and by means of the sports spectacle. But it didn't always translate economically. Though race athletes are highly paid, especially in comparison to the socioeconomic conditions of their formative years, they still tend to be paid lower salaries than white players based on actual performance. Now, this might be due to viewer discrimination. Statistics have shown that viewership increases when there is greater participation by white players, which in turn leads to higher advertising incomes and then higher salaries. Of course, there's nothing like a winning team to draw fans, regardless of the racial or ethnic makeup of the players. Going back to the point I made earlier about sports and the national self-image, Michael Oriard, a professor of English at Oregon State, who has studied fan behavior, has said that in a simplistic way, as a fan, the team you attach yourself to becomes an extension of you. When they win, you feel like you win. Winning becomes a way to connect to your city. End of part two.